Well, as we continue our series on calling, um, we've gone through this kind of uh, process of dealing with um, people's calling, how to hear from God, how to respond, what God's purpose on our life is. We've, we've uh, differentiated between an occupation and a vocation. Occupation is what you do to pay the bills. Vocation is calling, voce. It's what God has placed in you. It's what you have to live out, and you might happen to live that out where your occupation is, but you're going to live it out one way or another. God wired you up a certain way. He gave you his Holy Spirit. He gave you spiritual gifts. He gave you circumstances that you grew up in. He gave you the personality that you have. He gave you the context that you're in, and he has a calling upon your life. The problem is most people don't enter into their calling because uh, our world teaches them to identify themselves by what they do for a living that pays the bills and pursue success at all costs so that you can show that what you do to pay the bills, uh, you do really well. And so as we talked about that, I've run into people, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, People who are just now evaluating in life, what has my life been about? If, is that true, that God has a unique call upon my life, that he prepared works for me to do beforehand, and he's equipped me and gifted me and gave me a specific vocation calling? And so we just talked about that. It's kind of stirred the waters in people's lives. As we talk about today, what I want you to see is this. When we talk about divine humility, really the flip side of that is, is um, coming to the place where you can surrender your kingdom and enter into God's kingdom. Now, you do that by faith in Jesus, and you receive him as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. But oftentimes, we're still holding back. The scene that we're going to read about in the narrative of Luke chapter 22 is when Jesus has had uh, the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room right before he's going to the cross. He disrobes, washes their feet, and they share the meal together. Jesus, the leader, the rabbi, them, the disciples, he is serving them. In verse 24, now watch this. I love the disciples because I can so identify with them. Um, Right after he serves them, right after they have this worship service, you know, they just got through singing, Holy Spirit, you know, they were there in the moment, right? Immediately, verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. It'd be like uh, us just singing that song and immediately as soon as we're done, you lean over and go, I'm probably the best singer in the room. I mean, it's just that kind of disconnect because they just had the Passover meal. Jesus just uh, disrobed and washed their feet, and all of a sudden they start going, I think I'm really going to be the most important person in the kingdom. Because the issue is all about the kingdom for them. Jesus, the one, the Messiah who's come to usher in the kingdom of God, and they're going to get to be Israel again. They're going to get to be a great, uh, great nation again. And the disciples are going to get to be like in charge of stuff. And that's what they're, that's what they're gunning for. What they have in mind is different than what Jesus is trying to communicate to them. So then Jesus says to them, look guys, the king of the Gentiles, they lorded over them. And those who exercise authorities call themselves benefactors. But you're not supposed to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the least or the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Now, Jesus has just got through being the servant at the table. Is not the one who is at the table greater, but I among you am the one who serves? So Jesus is explaining this example right in front of them. And then he says this, you are those, you are the ones who have stood by me in my trials. Look, I, I, I'm the rabbi, I'm the Messiah, and yet you have seen that I serve, and you have seen that I go through difficult stuff, and you've stood by me in it. And I confer on you a kingdom, and what Jesus is implying here is it's not the kingdom you think. 
I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. If my father conferred a kingdom on me that involves me um, washing you guys' feet, <laughs> if my, my father conferred a kingdom on me that involves me washing y'all's feet and going through all these difficulties, I confer a kingdom upon you. You will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, Jesus says, and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he says this, Simon, Simon. Now remember, this whole series we've been doing the double name thing, right? When God calls someone's name twice, it's like, what? All right? He says, Simon, Simon. But also remember, Simon is kind of the lead disciple. He's the one who said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, Petros, this confession, I will build my church. In other words, what Jesus is saying is everyone who confesses, like Peter has just confessed, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, this is how my church will be built. All right? And he calls him Rocky. In our, in our, in our culture, it would be Rocky, right? Petros, rock. Peter means rock. And so his name is Simon, but he has the nickname Rocky. All right? So also pay attention whenever name change happens in someone's life. All right? Jacob becomes... Israel, right? Paul, Saul becomes? All right. Name change is important because identity is everything. And identity and calling go together. So he says, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. All right. Satan wants to take you out. But I'm praying for you. Jesus is praying on his ha behalf. He's not pay praying for the hedge of protection, whatever that is. <laughs> he's not praying that you won't go through it. What he's praying is, watch, that your faith may not fail. Jesus just got through saying, I'm the servant, I've gone through trials. Oh, by the way, Satan is after you, Simon Peter. And I'm praying. I'm your mediator. I'm, I'm there. I'm in your corner. And I'm praying that your faith may not fail. Now watch this. And when you have turned back, <laughs> after the trial, after you have face-planted, I am praying that your faith will not fail. In other words, you're going to fail, but I pray that your faith in me does not. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Simon Peter says, no way. It's not going to happen. I'll go with you to prison. I'll go with you to your death. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. Uh, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Um, then Jesus says this. Hey, you guys, you remember when I sent you out in twos? And I told you, don't take anything with you. Don't take a wallet. Don't take a backpack. Don't take an extra clothes. Don't take, don't take anything. You just go out in twos, and I'll provide. And they're like, yeah, we remember that. It was awesome. We went out. We didn't take anything with us, and everything was provided for. He says, right. Did you lack anything? No, no, we didn't lack anything. Verse 35. Now, if you have a purse, take it. If you have a bag, take it. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and get a sword. It is written. Now, Jesus is pivoting, and he's turning toward the cross, right? It is written, he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus was crucified with uh, two criminals. He was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled. So what Jesus is doing is saying, hey, remember when I sent you out and everything was taken care of? You lacked nothing? And they're like, yeah, we remember. Jesus now pivots and says, I'm going to the cross. This is going to happen. It's going to be fulfilled. They're clueless. They don't get it. But what they do is very telling. The disciples say, 
hey, Lord, look, we're already prepared. We've got two swords, all right? What this shows you is two things. One, the disciples had been told to go out and be dependent upon Jesus and not their own wallet, their own sword, their own protection, their own whatever, uh, their own self-reliance, their own capacities or abilities. So you go out in my name and my kingdom will manifest and you will experience that. And then he asked them, did you lack anything? And they're like, no. When we just relied solely on you, everything was provided. But when Jesus turns and talks about the cross and about, about purse, now ha- take one, swords. Hey, if you don't have one, go out, sell your cloak, get a sword. The disciples pull out their backup plan. Like, hey, we're going to follow you, Jesus, and we're totally into you, and, and we, we, we're your people, and we're your disciples, but oh, just in case, we got an ATM card, we got cell phone, and we are, uh, you know, what's uh, cert- certified to carry or whatever, licensed to James Bond. Some of y'all got your, your permit. We got ours just in case. I'm trusting you, Lord. You got my protection, but I also have a 9 millimeter right here. All right? And this is, this is how it's going down. Some of you got offended by that, but you were going to get offended anyway. So anyway, um, here's what I want you to see. First thing, one of the reasons that we do not pursue our calling is we are paralyzed by perfection. We want everyone to see us as the greatest, as the most important, as the most significant. And that's our argument in our culture. What do you do? Well, I'm a banker. Oh, really? I work in systems analysis. Oh, really? Well, I am an astronaut. I mean, you know, and everyone's trying to kind of, how significant are you? How successful are you? And we explain to everybody by what we do and where our rank is by what we do. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You want to be successful and you are paralyzed in pursuit of your kingdom and you're missing out on my kingdom because you're not pursuing your calling. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. The greatest will be least. And Jesus says, look at me. I wait tables. Look at me, I wash feet. Look at me in the trials that I have been to, and God has confirmed upon me a kingdom, and I'm going to give that kingdom to you. And they're, they're, it's, not, it's not computing with them, and it's not computing with us. I had the privilege of uh, teaching at the med school this week, and after I taught, talked a little bit about calling, some of the things we've been talking about here, standing down... And a couple, talked to a couple of med students. One med student comes up to me and he says, hey, um, I, I, I'm really struggling with this. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. And I said, you don't think you're supposed to be at this Bible study? He goes, no, no, I don't think I'm supposed to be here at med school. And I said, well, why are you here? He goes, well, I mean, I'm studying to be a doctor. My wife is at Galveston and she's at med school studying to be a doctor. And we kind of see each other on the weekends and we're both going to be doctors. And I said, but, but you don't think you're supposed to be here, so why are you here? And he's like, well, I want to marry someone who's going to be a doctor, and I'm going to be what? You know, just like, you know, stay-at-home dad? What, what, I mean, and I said, so you're telling me the reason you're in med school is because you are competing with your wife to make sure that you are as successful as she is and that you guys are going to be the power couple and that if you don't do this, you're going to somehow be less of a person or less loved by her or less. And he's like, well, I mean, I know that sounds silly, but I said, dude, she's not in love with you because you're going to be a doctor. She's in love with you because of you. And he goes, that's what she told me. And I said, well, you don't got to believe her. (laughs) But here's the thing. How many of us How many of us are pursuing something not because it is intrinsically us, but because it's expected of us, or we think we should? And we get on that treadmill early and often. We never figure out who we're supposed to be, who God's called us to be, regardless of where we work. 
See, everyone wants to be loved for who they are and not in spite of who they are. And so we're always putting our best foot forward. I filled out my online profile for dating and I said, I'm kind of a loser and I'm not very smart and I like to lay around and do nothing most of the time. No one says stuff like that. They put their best foot forward. Why? Because they want to be loved for who they want you to perceive them to be in spite of who they actually are. And Simon Peter wants to be the greatest And yet Satan is seeking to sift him. And Jesus comes to him and says, Simon, you're going to get torn up. Oh, by the way, I'm praying for you. Not that you won't fail because you are going to fail. I'm praying that your faith will be strong. That after you failed, now listen to this. After you failed, you will go back and encourage those around you. Look, I've been honest with you guys. And I don't, you know, some people get uncomfortable. Oh, Pastor Jeff's crying again. He's talking about his junk. and uh." I don't do that because it makes me feel good and I get a lot of energy out of it. The reason I share my brokenness, the reason I share my face plant, the reason I share my struggles is to give you permission to share yours. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to fake it. We say it around here all the time. There, everyone is in need of recovery or repentance on some level all the time. There is nobody in here whose stuff doesn't stink. We're not wanting you to fake it. We're wanting that your faith will not fail after you face planted. And you will, as a result, be able to go back and tell your story and encourage the others. Dude, I'm following Jesus. The guards got him. I'm standing there. And someone says, hey, do you know him? And I thought, no, I don't know him. And then I'm like, okay. And then somebody else says, do you know him? I said, I don't know him. And the third time, I denied Jesus three times, dude. And then the rooster crowed just like he said. And I was so embarrassed, and I saw him get crucified, and I'm just defeated. So I ran off to the beach, and I got back in my boat, and I'm like, I'm done. I'm no good. I can't be used by God anymore. I'm just going to go back and fish. I'm going to go back and do, make a living, put a roof over my head, feed, because I'm, I'm not good enough to serve God. And then Jesus, after he's resurrected, he comes back. He comes down to my boat on the beach, and he makes me breakfast, and he waits. And then he comes up to me, and he says, dude, why are you fishing? Come on, come follow me. What Jesus says is, your brokenness and your failure is the story of God's redemption and grace in your life, so now go out and share it with other people. And tell them about how good he is. <laughs> my my uh, third kid, she's a sophomore at college, and her freshman year was a wreck. Like, her first semester freshman year was just bad. She got in trouble. She was not having fun. She wasn't having friends. She would call, and she would talk to my wife like every day, like four times, crying, just bleh. And she got a reputation as that, that homesick kid, Right? And you have to know Hadley. Hadley is just a love and joy when she's a love and joy. And she is a nightmare when she's a nightmare. Like, however she's feeling, you're feeling it. You don't just know it, you are feeling it, right? And so she's miserable, and and Jody's like, oh, she called again. You know, I mean, because we're all feeling it, right? And so we get a call last week. That, that That was last year, her freshman year. We get a call last week. She went to college where we went to college. And... One of our friends who was in college when we were there calls us and says, your daughter met with our daughter, who's a freshman. And our daughter is miserable and homesick and is wanting to quit and come home. And so people told her, hey, go talk to Hadley Harris. (laughs) And she's like the go-to person for homesick people. Why? Because she's paying it forward. 
The hurt and the trial that God put in her life, as little as it is, is her story. And she tells her story. And people knew about it. And she's rebounding and God brought her through it. And this is God's story to us. Is Look, you're going to fail. You are going to fail. There's not anyone in here who hasn't failed. And people come into the church and they're uncomfortable because of all the church people. Dude, church people are some of the most jacked up people I know. Well, I don't want to I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I don't want to go to church. Dude, the church is like saying, I don't want to go to the hospital because I'm sick. What? That's crazy talk. But because we're not sharing our story, because we're not telling people our failures, there are people out there that won't come in here because they're afraid they're going to be judged. They're afraid they're not good enough. Well, I had one guy two weeks ago say, I'm not ready to be baptized. I, I've got to work on some things first. Yeah, you get everything straightened out before you come to church. Make sure you've got everything together before you get baptized. Make sure you're no longer doing this, that, or the other before you join a life group. Make sure that you're totally healed before you go to the hospital. That's right. It's crazy. And yet we're the ones perpetuating it. Why? Because we put our best foot forward. Yes, I went to church this morning. <sighs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and instead, we should be like Peter. We should say, man, I want to be greatest, but the truth of the matter is I stink. And I'm coming back to the disciples, and I'm supposed to be the leader of the disciples, and yet I'm the biggest betrayer of all the disciples, and yet I'm the leader of the disciples, and yet God, He's restored me, and so I'm coming back to you saying, look, if he can restore me, he can restore you. If he can love me after I let him down and betrayed him, he can love you after you let him down and betray him. And you do, and you did. And Jesus anticipates, and he's prepared for our failure. He anticipated Peter's, and he anticipated ours. He anticipated Peter's and said, just pray that you'll keep the faith, I'm praying for you. And he anticipates ours because he went to the cross and he paid for our sins before we were ever even born. Before you were born, Jesus anticipated every sin and mistake you would ever make and he loves you anyway. He says, I'm paying it. It's good. I love him. I love her. It's done. It's good. And just like he anticipated your sin and made provision for it, he also anticipated your good works. The good works that he prepared beforehand. And what he's saying is, don't get distracted. Our pursuit of success oftentimes derails us from significance. We want to present the best foot forward. We want to show the world how significant and important we are. And we're willing to go to med school even though we don't want to practice medicine. God wired you up. He made you just who you are for a purpose and for a reason. And there's no insignificant role. But you've got to step into your calling by identifying who God made you to be, not what you do for a living. The final thing is this, that Jesus beyond what we don't understand. <laughs> he gets down to the end there, and he says, what did you lack? They say, nothing. He says, well, now, if you don't have a purse, get a purse, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and get swords. And so they say, we got swords. And Jesus' response is, that's enough. Or it was, two swords, okay, that's enough. I don't know which one, <laughs> you know, it could be interpreted either way. That's enough. But I kind of get the feeling that Jesus is like, yeah, that'll work. That's fine. Because it's not about the swords is what he's saying. Your backup plan is that thing that you hold on to in case Jesus' kingdom doesn't work out for you. A kingdom is your sphere of influence. All right? For instance, my kingdom is four acres in Leon Springs, and I have a dog and a cat and a pig. And I can, come here, blue, and blue comes. Sit. He sits. Unfortunately, this morning, he didn't obey, and he smells like skunk right now. But the point is, 
That's my authority. That's my realm, my domain. We all have a sphere of authority. And Jesus says, I'm giving you my kingdom. The disciples are holding on to swords. Why? Because in their mind, the kingdom is like King David and Solomon. We're going to have a castle, and we're going to have armies, and we're going to have gold. That's what they're thinking in their mind. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Get it in your head. My kingdom's upside down. Servant is the greatest. Greatest servant. First, last, last verse. It looks different. And they still don't get it. And their backup plan is their sword. We're going to make the kingdom happen. We got you, Jesus. Don't worry. They're not going to put you on a cross. We're going to be a great nation. What's your backup plan? Jesus says, follow me. Here's my kingdom. My kingdom come. My kingdom come. My will be done. You know where Jesus' kingdom is? First of all, the kingdom is within, he says. The kingdom is where his will and realm is made manifest. In other words, whenever you say yes to Jesus, his kingdom comes. Whenever you obey, his kingdom manifests. It goes from the invisible to the visible on earth as it is in heaven. Whenever his will is done, his realm, his authority is made manifest. And so what are you doing in your life? Are you pursuing his kingdom or yours? And some of you and me, we're like the disciples. We're following. We're with you, Jesus. We're with you, Jesus. Just happened to keep my forward here just in case. What you are holding on to is your backup plan. What you're holding on to is your self-reliance. Oh, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you so much. You're just going to be able to take care of this, and I'm just going to make sure that I have my wallet, my cell phone, everything that I need to, to solve it in case you don't. What's your backup plan? The self-reliant thing that you hold on to. That is the thing that prevents you from surrendering and entering Craig Rochelle said it at Leadership Summit, you've got to step out of your fear that you're not going to be good enough. Fear that you're a hypocrite. Fear that people won't accept you. Fear that you won't be able to become what it is that you have your mindset on becoming. You've got to step out of your fear and into your calling if you're going to manifest the kingdom of God. What are you holding on to that prevents you from embracing your calling or even discovering what it is? Some of you are here today and you don't think you're good enough to be a follower of Christ. You've never committed to Jesus because of the sin in your life. You've never committed to Jesus because of what you've done in the past or what you're addicted to or what your ha hurt or habit or hang up is. And Jesus says it's not about that. It's about coming and following me in your imperfection. It's not about what you do. It's what I have done and what you need to do is place your faith in me. Same thing that Jesus says to Simon. He says, I pray that your faith will not fail. Place your faith in Jesus. It's not about what you have done or haven't done. It's about what he has done and who he is. Laura and the band are going to come and they're going to sing this song. And during the course of this song, I want you to think about a couple of things. One, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus and received his life, I want you to think about why is something stirring in your spirit right now? Why are you emotional or uncomfortable right now? Why is God tugging at you? Words that we would say, because we've all experienced that. Because he's pursuing you. Because he loves you. He has a purpose and reason for your life. Others of you are here today, and you've been followers of Christ for a long time, and yet you're pursuing the normal American world agenda. Good job nice family, house, couple of cars, and that is the focus and energy of your life. And you do some good things on the side, whatever the church asks you to do, you go to the life group thingy, and then you do, you do a little thing here, you little thing here. But if you were to say, hey, what is God's calling on you? You would not tangibly be able to articulate it. 
And you just sense him pulling you, pulling you toward clarity, toward more specific purpose. We're just going to do something different today. Laura and her team are going to sing, and you're going to sit there. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to come and kneel, kneel. If you want to come and talk to a prayer team under each cross, do that. If you want to fill out a next step card, do that. If you want to just pray. But as these words are sung over you that Jesus is our defender, that he's the one who paid, that he's the one who makes the way, that he anticipated your inability and your failure and has got it covered, and he has a kingdom for you, and it's not your kingdom. It's his. And he's asking you to let go of your backup plan, let go of your self-reliance, and by faith, follow. As God moves in you, and you respond to him, under each cross will be our prayer team. They're going there now. When I was at the medical school this week, and I was talking to doctors and dentists and nurses and PT folks, one of the gals that was in the talk um, came up to me and said, the students, they come to me and they tell me what's going on in their world and, and I pray for them. That's my, that's my calling here in this place. God has called me to be here and to pray for these students. I looked at her badge and it said, maintenance support. The doctors, the people who are going to bring healing to people in the future, go to the custodian for prayer. She says, it's my calling. Yeah, I mop. Yeah, I clean windows. Yeah, I clean toilets around here. That's just what I do for a check. But my calling is I am the pastor of the med school and I pray for these people when they have need. When you leave today, I pray that you would step out of your fear and into your calling. I pray that, pray that you would be willing to risk letting go of your kingdom and finding and pursuing the one that Jesus has for you. Because you are far more significant than merely pursuing worldly success. In advance, he prepared for your failure. And in advance, he prepared for the works that he's going to do through you. I hope you'll step in to your calling. Thank you.